you want to take your Bibles out and turn to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 28. Jeremiah was a prophet to the people of Jerusalem right around the time when Jerusalem was collapsing and about to fall to Babylon. It was a difficult time to be a prophet, and this is where Jeremiah is. We're going to read about Jeremiah encountering a false prophet named Hananiah, and uh, let's hear what God's Word has to say to us. Jeremiah 28, starting at verse 1. In that same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fifth month of the fourth year, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, and all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, And all the exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times, prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke bars from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke them. Uh, Just a little bit of context there. In the previous chapter, God said to Jeremiah, I want you to put a yoke on your neck because I am taking this nation where you are, the nation of Israel, and I am submitting this nation under the yoke of Babylon. And so Jeremiah walked around with this yoke around his neck. So Hananiah breaks that yoke from the neck of Jeremiah. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations within two years. But Jeremiah the prophet went his way. Sometime after, the prophet Hananiah had broke the yoke bars from off the neck of Jeremiah the prophet. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go tell Hananiah, Thus says the Lord, you have broken wooden bars, but you have made in their place bars of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put upon the neck of all these nations an iron yoke to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. For I have given to him even the beasts of the field. And Jeremiah the prophet said to the prophet Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. And you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. In that same year, in the seventh month, the prophet Hananiah died. See, in the Old Testament... Leadership was by prophets and priests and kings. If you look at the screen here or on the cover of your bulletin, there's three pictures there. We have a scroll, which is prophecy, a cross, which represents sacrifice as a priest, and then a crown for, for kings. In the Old Testament, these were who provided leadership for the people of Israel. And then came Jesus who is the ultimate prophet and priest and king. And because of him, there was a fulfillment of all of these Old Testament offices. 
Let's uh, answer this question here together. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been appointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Next one. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. So Jesus is the ultimate prophet and priest and king. But then as Christians, we are prophets and priests and kings too. As we are called Christians, we follow Jesus Christ, we share in his anointing. Let's answer this. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. So hit the next one there. So we have, we are prophets in that we are anointed to confess his name. We are priests as we present ourselves to him as living sacrifices of thanks and we are kings because we strive against sin and the devil and then afterward when all is said and done we'll reign with Christ for all eternity. So prophets today. People often think of prophecy as foretelling the future as in saying what is going to happen and, there's, and sometimes that is what prophecy is. But primarily, prophecy is to reveal God's truth. Sometimes that is concerning the future, but sometimes that is for the here and now. And for most of the prophets, they were relaying God's messages to those people of that particular time, calling them to turn from sin, to turn back to God, to follow the Lord, to remember Him and respect Him, and so forth. So God gives a message to the prophet, and then the prophet relays that message to the king, to the people, or whoever. Now, in Jeremiah's time, in Jeremiah's time, the sin of Jerusalem was enormous. It was beyond the point of no return, so to speak. God, at one point in Jeremiah 5, verse 1, says to Jeremiah, I want you to go all around Jerusalem and see if you can find just one person, just one, who is honest and deals rightfully with people. And of course, Jeremiah couldn't find one. There was a lot of killing of innocent poor people. So in Jeremiah 2, it says, On your skirts is found the lifeblood of the guiltless poor. You did not find them breaking in. Yet in spite of all these things, you say, I am innocent. So they killed people, and they claimed to be innocent. They had as many gods as cities, this whole area of Judah. Your gods have become as many as your cities. It literally says that in Jeremiah eleven thirteen. And in Jerusalem, there was an altar to Baal on every street. And it says that also in 11.13. And they sacrificed their own children to Baal in a very gruesome sort of a way. You have filled this place with the blood of the innocents and have built the high places of Baal to burn sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come into my mind. So, in Jeremiah's day, this was the situation. This is what God's people were doing. And it was heartbreaking and sad. Jeremiah prophesied doom and called for repentance. If you are doing these things, this is, 
then God has prescribed doom for you. You need to repent. You need to repent now in sackcloth and in ashes. But he says at one point in Jeremiah 6, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord to them is an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. They don't want to hear that they're sinful and that they're headed for doom. Nobody's listening to me. And indeed, people didn't listen to Jeremiah. So Jeremiah was prophesying doom and calling for repentance, while there was others, such as Hananiah, who was prophesying peace and deliverance. That, hey, everything's okay. God's going to deliver you. You're all right. Two times in Jeremiah, it talks about false prophets who are about them who says, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So everything's fine. Nothing's wrong. I'm okay. You're okay. Everybody's okay. Let's just get along, you know? That kind of thing. Hananiah's name means Yahweh, the Lord, has been gracious. And yes, Yahweh has been gracious, but when God's grace becomes a license to do whatever you want, then that's not grace anymore. What's interesting about this passage here that we read a moment ago is that Hananiah is called a prophet five times. Maybe you picked that up. He's called a prophet five times here. In other words, he was esteemed as a prophet. People thought of him as a prophet. They looked to him as a prophet. They went to him and said, tell us what God has to say. And they believed him. So they thought of him as a prophet. And so five times here, it reinforces that Hananiah is a prophet. Now it's bad enough to teach what is false, but it's far worse to do so in the name of the true God. Hananiah knows how to sound like a legitimate prophet. He knows how prophets talk, and he can talk the talk pretty well. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, and he throws out there, declares the Lord. He knows how to talk like a prophet. He knows how to sound like a prophet. He knows how to say what the people will eat up and listen to and believe. And I find it fascinating that Jeremiah hears this false prophecy, something that he knows is wrong. You know, Jerusalem is going to be delivered and the things that Babylon took from us, those are going to be brought back. And the king that they took away, he's going to be brought back. Everything's going to be great. And Jeremiah says, Amen. Amen. May it be so. May the Lord make happen what you say. Jeremiah wishes it were true. He he loves his people. He loves the place where he he lives, as we all do. I, I wish it were true. Amen. Make it so. May the Lord make that happen. That's what I want, right there. But there's this but. There's a but there. Jeremiah says, But you know as well as I, that the prophets who have gone before us have all prophesied doom. So, the one who now prophesies peace, let it be known that you are a true prophet once that peace happens. He's kind of in a soft way saying, we'll see. We'll see. Verse 8, Hannah and I have prophesied contrary to the prophets of the past. Prophets were frequently condemning sins, warning of doom, and calling for repentance. And here's Hananiah saying, hey, everything's fine. It's going to be okay. Before this time, Isaiah had prophesied doom for Jerusalem in Isaiah 5, 5 through 7. 
God says, and I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard, as in Jerusalem. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, for briars or thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they shall rain no rain upon it, and so forth. My people go into exile for lack of knowledge. So Isaiah prophesied this. Micah also beforehand prophesied this. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give a judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. They were doing this even long ago in Micah's day. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. So God's truth today must be consistent with the truth of the past. We can't just make stuff up. And then the last verse that we read, verse 17, Hananiah, the one proclaiming deliverance in two years, himself died in just two months. He prophesied what was false. And he knew how to sound like a prophet. Jeremiah called him on it. And he died in two years. Instead of being delivered, he himself died. In Deuteronomy 18, it says, If you say in your heart, how may we know that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So here we have, Exactly God's prescription for how do you tell what a false prophet is. If a prophet says, oh, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't, then you know that God has not sent him. False prophets and teachers are just as prevalent today. And like Jeremiah, you and I have to be able to recognize them. Hananiah was called a prophet And uh, he came from among the people. He was from Gibeon. That's not far away from Jerusalem. So, by appearances, he would have been just like Jeremiah. You know, he's recognized as a prophet. He comes from among the people. The false prophets today will call themselves Christians. They know how to talk the talk. They know how to mix enough truth in with the lies to make it sound right. And their books are in Christian bookstores. Their sermons are in local pulpits. And their songs are played on Christian radio. We need to be on guard. We need to be able to tell what's true from what's not true. They teach what makes us feel good. This is what Han and I was teaching. He's teaching deliverance and I'm okay and you're okay and everybody's okay. It appeals to what we desire as human beings, not necessarily what's true. It appeals to our pride and our self-interest. So Hananiah was saying, hey, Jerusalem, God is going to protect it. This is God's city. This is what prophets were were saying back then. And their self-interest, hey, we're going to be saved. We're going to be delivered. We don't have to worry. That's what they would have liked to have heard. We have a lot of people out there saying things that we want to hear too. Some teach that God doesn't judge, that he's just a nice guy who loves everybody and, and everything's going to be okay for everybody. It doesn't matter what you do. Some teach that there is no hell, there is no eternal judgment, no eternal condemnation, contrary to what the Bible says. Some teach that all religions lead to the same God, as if they were all basically the same. You don't need Jesus. Some teach that it's your body and you can do with it what you want. 
Some teach that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're just a nice person. That beliefs don't matter at all. And some teach something called a health and wealth gospel. For example, here's a direct quote. I'm not going to name any names, but here's a direct quote from somebody. God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny He has laid out for us. That's, we would love to believe that, wouldn't we? We'd love to be financially secure and that God wants us to have lots of money. But that is not, that is not God for us. That is not consistent with what the Bible says. Another one, why don't you start believing that no matter what you have or haven't done, that your best days are still out in front of you? It doesn't matter what you do or haven't done, your best days are ahead. That really sounds like Hananiah. It doesn't matter how sinful you guys are, your best days are ahead of you. God's going to deliver you. That also is false. Life's too short to spend it trying to keep others happy. All right, good. I like that. You can't please everyone. Oh, that's, that's very true. I, I know that really well from being in this position here. To fulfill your destiny, stay true to your heart. Uh, no. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Jesus said, out of the heart come evil thoughts. The Bible doesn't tell you to stay true to your heart. Some of the scariest words in the New Testament are against false teachers. Galatians 1. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. In other words, damn him to hell. And as we have said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. 2 Peter 2, your Bible reading for today. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. When I read those verses like that, and there's a bunch of others too, especially being in a position like this, I, I get chills. You see how important it is to preach what is true, to teach what is true, and the consequences of preaching what is false. It gives, you, it gives me, anyways, it gives me chills. All right. We are prophets and priests and kings as believers in Christ. As anointed prophets, Christians must discern truth from error. Because there are false prophets out there. And they mix in what is true with what is false so that we'll believe things that are false. It sounds good. It appeals to us. It's easy to believe. And it's very dangerous because of that. The counterfeit truth is very close to the original truth. If you were going to be somebody who wanted to print counterfeit money, let's say that you are a dishonest person, you wanted to have a bunch of money and you were going to print it up, that you were going to make it counterfeit. What you would do is you wouldn't make something that's obviously fake. You wouldn't make monopoly money. You would make something that looks as close to the original as possible. If you were going to make up something that was, wasn't real money, you, were, you would make it as close to the original as possible. The people who are trained out there who study money, currency, are the ones who know the actual currency the best. They study the true currency in all of its details so that when they see something that has something missing or something added, they recognize it. This is, this is counterfeit. So, God's Word. Know the original to spot the counterfeit. 
know what God's Word says so that when somebody says something that is not consistent with it, you can recognize it. You can recognize it as something that just appeals to our own pride or our own selfish interests, something that we would want to believe instead of what is true. God doesn't change. His truth is eternal. So what is true back then is also true today. And whatever is prophesied and taught today has to be consistent with the prophets of the past. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and he will not fulfill it? Or in Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, because God's truth is sometimes not what we want to hear, sometimes injurious to our pride and not according to our self-interest, be ready to respond to what stings as much as what soothes. We have to be able to hear the truth of God that stings as much as the truth that soothes us. Jeremiah had a lot of stinging things to say. And the people needed to hear it, but it didn't appeal to their pride, and it didn't appeal to their self-interest, so they didn't hear it. Eh. They probably saw Jeremiah as like one of those guys who stand on a street corner with a sign that says the world is ending. Eh. You know? They didn't want to hear what he had to say, even though he was speaking the truth. So we need to listen to what's hard to hear as much as the things that we would want to hear. God is a God of grace. Let's not forget that. Let's not push that aside. God has been gracious. And He is a God of grace. But if you read the prophets, there's something that comes out about God's grace that's important for us. God's grace always accompanies a call to repent to change, to turn from sin, not to excuse it, to repent. God's love and God's justice, they go together. And God's mercy and His judgment, they go together. So God is gracious. But let us turn. Let us hear where we need to turn and let's respond as such. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, we, we recognize, Lord, that it's easy to believe things that appeal to us, not necessarily what are things that are true. So, Lord, we pray that we would know your word and who you are so that when there is counterfeit truth out there, we would be able to recognize it. And we'd be able to spot it and be able to know that, Lord, you have not spoken it. So Lord, help us to be able to distinguish that as your anointed prophets here in this earth for this time. So we pray that you would open our eyes to that. In Jesus' name, amen.